Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage, and we're back with another of our five minute history videos. And today I'm on the 1500 block of Madison Avenue in West Baltimore, and we're gonna talk about the building behind me, the American Legion Federal Post Number 19. It was founded in 1930 and is one of the oldest black American Legion posts in the state. But before we get to that, I have a confession to make. Before preparing for this video, I did not know a whole lot about the American Legion. I knew that it was for veterans, but I didn't know when it was founded. I didn't know who founded it. I didn't know what kind of activities they did. So I thought we'd start with a few words about the American Legion first, and then we'll get to post number 19. The Legion was founded uh, right at the conclusion of World War I, I think 1920, and it was founded through a charter of Congress, a congressional charter. But like a lot of things, uh, Congress didn't act all on its own. It acted at the prompting of citizens. In this case, the citizens were a thousand members of the U.S. Expeditionary Force, the fighting force, America's fighting force in Europe in World War I. These thousand members got together in Paris uh, before returning home and decided there needed to be an organization to provide services for returning vets. To get this organization going, they elected an executive committee of 17 members, and they chose pretty wisely for those 17. Let me read to you uh, a few of the folks who were on there. One gentleman was Henry Lindsley, the former mayor of Dallas. He was a service member and fought in World War I. So was Robert Bacon, the former Secretary of State, Luke Lee, a senator from Tennessee, William Donovan, who later went on to become head of the OSS, which of course then became the CIA, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., the former president's eldest son. There was one member from Baltimore, a gentleman named Redmond Stewart, and there was at least one African-American member, a gentleman named Eric Dickerson, who went on to become a prominent civil rights attorney, arguing many cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, over the years, the American Legions had a number of noteworthy accomplishments. Maybe foremost was in 1944, they prompted Congress uh, to enact the Servicemen's Readjustment Act. You will know it as the GI Bill. And maybe some of you out there have family members who benefited from the GI Bill. You can say thank you to the American Legion for that one. Um, and although the organization is national in scope, its headquarters is in Indianapolis, it's got local posts like this one um, that allow its members to get involved uh, in the local communities around them. So 1930 is when this one was formed, one of the oldest black uh, American Legion posts uh, in the state. It was formed at a time when black service members were coming back to America after fighting for America in World War One, and then having to fight for their own civil rights here. Um, as W.E.B. Du Bois remarked um, on this fight, he said, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. And of course, fighting is for their uh, civil rights for African Americans. One of the ways to fight was by establishing uh, black American Legion posts. Um, uh, the American Legion was segregated uh, in its founding, like most of the rest of America. Um, and so founding posts like this for black service members um, was a way to advance uh, civil rights uh, locally and nationally. Um, post number 19 was not the first black post in the state, in the city. Post number 14 was. It got going right at the conclusion of World War I after the charter, after Congress gave the charter. But in 1930, a number of members of post number 14, who were by then civil servants, many of whom worked for the post office, um, thought that they needed their own post uh, for civil servants. Their founder was a gentleman named Bernard Hyder, and their first commander, a gentleman named Emery Cole. And from the beginning, these folks made sure that post number 19 was very active. Um, in 1932, during the Depression, they helped veterans find jobs. In 1935, they formed the Women's Auxiliary so that women could get involved with their activities. In 1937, they formed the Sons of Legion Squadron number 19, so at least some of their family members could get involved. And in 1951, they won an award uh, for all of the help that they had been giving to Providence Hospital here in Baltimore. So very active locally. At the state and national level, they were also, their members were also very active, often breaking through color uh, barriers. This was at a time when the American Legion was run um, almost exclusively by white veterans. Um, so the accomplishments of post number 19 were especially noteworthy. In 1935, for example, Clarence Tidings uh, was elected one of the very few representatives from Maryland to the 
the National Conference. In 1940, Percy Smith was elected state vice commander. And in 1944, John Stewart was elected to the state executive com committee. Um, again, at a time when these positions uh, um, almost always were held by white veterans. One of the uh, things that this club has been most proud of is it the Blue Helmet uh, Drum and Bugle Corps. Um, it was founded in its earliest days. Uh, the uh, first drum and bugle corps, uh, black drum and bugle corps in the state of Maryland. And it, uh, it did exceptionally well. It performed at conferences and parades and competitions nationally. Many of them uh, it won. And it became kind of an ambassador for the city of Baltimore uh, across the country. Unfortunately, it disbanded in 1974 after the building behind me caught on fire. Um, and the organization went through a little bit of a crisis. Um, and that brings me to the building itself. For the first 10 years or so, post number 19 did not have its own home. It met at the uh, YMCA on Druid Hill Avenue, not too far away. And then it met at the a local hotel around the corner called the New York Hotel. And for a while, it met at the Ubangi Club on Pennsylvania Avenue, one of the jazz clubs there. It met on the upper floors. Um, it might have been a little louder than the other places, but the benefit was after their meetings, they went downstairs and had beer and food. <laughs> totally reward for the meeting, for sure. Um, uh, but in 1945, it bought the building behind me, this row house on Madison Avenue, um, that it had, it had been renting for several years. And I'm going to wrap up to, uh, by saying today it is as going it is going as strong as ever. Um, it's got veterans now from the first and second Iraq wars as well as uh, Afghanistan, um, and it is very much still involved in the local community. It hosts back to school days uh, parties for kids uh, coming up here pretty soon. Um, it uh, hosts the James Mosier Little League uh, club baseball club. It provides Thanksgiving dinners for those in need. And I will have to say in conclusion that it is very much carrying on the motto that it started with, which is striving for a greater purpose. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.